there's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and our study tonight, or this, this morning, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. One God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Notice the adjective all, the word pas in the Greek language is used four times, therefore it dominates the subject of one God and one Father. Also, if you have a bulletin, you'll notice that this same idea is given to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 on the front of your bulletin. He says the similar thing to him about one God and Father. So that's going to be our discussion this morning. Notice at your paper, before I get into a word of study, uh, into a word of prayer with you, I wrote 4.6 out for you and showed you some interesting things just in the Greek language. For example, I didn't show you the Greek word for one, but it's the typical word for one, two, three, heis. But the word God, theos, is a nominative singular masculine. That N-S-M means nominal, nominative singular masculine. And the word father is pater in the Greek language. Notice it's nominative singular masculine. The word and, God and father, is chi, K-A-I. It's an adjunctive conjunction of nouns. That means that we're talking about two inseparable ideas. One God is one Father. He is one God and Father, or He is a God and Father in one. That's really important. Now look at the word who. Watch, look at the word who. The word who is a definite article without any verb in that sentence. There is no verb in that sentence. The word is, I put a mark through it, but I don't even think I, I'd, yeah, I put a mark through it. There's no verb. Normally that would be I me. It's not there. Rather, a lone definite article, whole, is a lone definite article. And I wrote it down for you. Watch this now, and I'll tell you why it's there. It's nominative singular masculine, which goes with God and Father. But he didn't put him out there with it. He didn't put the definite article with God nor Father. He saved it to put it over at the end. He, he did. Normally, that's first. It, it would be whole theos, whole pater. He did not do that. He took away a verb and put a definite article there to identify four pas, four alls. And the writers got it when they translated the definite article, the, by the word ho, who. The word ho is the word who in the English. Literally, it's the word the. He put, he took it away from over there, put it over here, didn't give you a verb, and gave you four adjectives to identify that. It's the word all. That's the most unique thing you'll ever see. Now watch the word all. It's the word pas. Watch the word all. See the first one? One God and Father of all. Genitive, plural. Masculine. That PL is plural. Now he does something really unique. 
He gives you three prepositional phrases. He gives you three prepositional phrases. You're not paying attention. These three alls are really important because they're identified with the one God and Father who is, who is of all, and then he gives you three prepositional phrases, A, B, and C. A, B, C. Now watch, the, watch when he does that. Watch what he does. Notice that every pos is plural. Do you see that? Every pos is plural. The first one's plural, the second one's plural, the third one's plural, and the fourth one's plural. All four pos, all four of the alls are plural. The last three are prepositions which are attached to all who are in God as your father. When God becomes your God and father, daddy, here's what you have. You have three prepositions. God, your father, is over all through all, and in all. Those are absolute promises. The word, the first all is genitive and is possession. When God becomes, when God takes possession of you at the point of salvation, when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, at that moment, God becomes your God and your father, your daddy. And that status becomes yours. You become united. All who are saved become united with God, the father. And as a result of that, he is over all, through all, and in all. You get that? We are the all. We are the all. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're saved by grace through faith. You're placed into a position where God is your father from that day forever. And he is your personal daddy, father. He's your Abba Pater. And as a result, he is over all, he is through all, and he is in all. What a relationship you have with God the Father by grace. Not by works, but by grace. What an enormous promise is given to you. There's not one religion that can do that. Not one. Not one. I don't care how monotheistic they are in their belief, whether it's Judaism or Islam. None of them can do it because the only way you can have a connection with God as your father it's through Jesus Christ, your Savior, who went to the cross and died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Judaism, a monotheistic religion of our day, and Islam, a monotheistic, they both reject that idea. And they're, they are the two major religions in the world that are monotheistic who claim identity with the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who reject Jesus Christ, the Messianic Savior, who reject Jesus Christ, work on the cross, his burial raised from the dead, they reject it. And their soul will be damned because of Adam's sin that can only be removed by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
This is what Paul is saying in the seventh and final doctrine. Why, the, why Christianity is greater than religions of the world. Religions of the world are run by the devil. Not by God the Father. He's run by the God of this world, not the God of all of the world. You know that? Let's pray. Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it and you can't live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. Out of carnality into spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit that's in your life is by confession of sin. You name it in silence and privacy through your priesthood status in Christ. And God will forgive you and he will cleanse you and he will restore you to relationship with him where he is overall in your life, he is through all of your life, and he's in your life, and he's in your life for eternity. I mean, how important is that to you today? God, your daddy, wants to take care of you, but he, got to, he takes care of you his way, not your way. He takes care of you by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's always a gift, not of works. You can't work God. It's all about believing God. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet to study the one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all as a grace principle. None of that is by works. It's all by grace. And we're so thankful for it today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to look at four things today in our first hour, and we have the Eucharist, the second hour. Four aspects of what Paul is talking about, about one God and Father. He holds the definite article off to later to identify what all God will do for you. What all God is your father will do for you. He held the definite article over here to say to you, God your father will do all, all, all. And he says it four times. All, 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 all of that for you. Right? Oh, well, please get that. The writer went to a lot of trouble to make sure you saw that. So we're going to take a look at that. And here's what it says to you, that God, listen to me, when God sent his son to die on a cross to be buried and raised from the dead for your salvation, God made a total commitment to every person that believes it. This passage is about a total commitment made by God to you. He is over all, he is, he is, he is of all, over all, through all, and in all. God is in all. He's not, you don't get a little bit of God. You get all of God. You know what he requires from you? Nothing. Zero. Faith. Non-meritorious. Non-meritorious thinking. Faith. Non-meritorious thinking, faith. Yeah? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Here's the gospel. Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised from the dead according to the Scriptures. Romans 1, 16, the gospel, I just explained it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. You don't get it because you sat in church. You don't get it because you say, I believe there is a Jesus. No, you get it because you say, I believe Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Then Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Now you got something working for you. Not you working for God, God working for you. That's a whole different ballgame. Now you have God. 
as your father of you, working over you, through you, and in you. Whoa. There's not a religion in the world that can offer you that deal. Not one. Because of John 14, 6. No man can come to the Father except through Christ. No one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. Any religion that rejects that as a source of salvation to relationship with a son, father relationship with God's lying to you. Lying to you. Lying to you. I don't care what they quote their history as. They're lying to you. They'll let them damn your soul. Point number one, the moment you believe the grace gospel of Jesus Christ, as I early explained, you become a son of God, and he becomes your Abba Father. Think about that. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become his child, you become a son of God, and he becomes your Abba Father. He becomes your Daddy God. Becomes your Daddy God. I explained to you in my introduction that all, all four passes, all, the, all four times the word all is used. It's used in the plural. But God and Father and who are in the singular. Every person that comes through the gospel of Christ, through God, this is what you get. You get all of God as your Father, of all, through all, over all, in all. You got enough of all? got plenty enough of all. You get all of them. That's that father-son relationship that you have for time and eternity. You ought to be so thankful this morning for that relationship that's based on grace and not works. You ought to be so thankful for it. Listen to this. I got it on your paper, so I want you to put your eyes on it. And if you, have, if you didn't pick up a paper, then get your Bible out. Get your Bible right now and take a look at Ephesians 4, 6. Because you're going to miss this. I, that's why I wrote it out on your paper, so you would not miss this. Now, watch what he says. Now, this is this great passage. It goes, it, this is found in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. I'm just looking at 6. Because you are sons... How do I become a son? I believe that Christ died for my sins, was buried, and raised from the dead third day. That's the gospel. You believe the gospel, you become a son of, a son of God. Hey, you're not going to get it any other way. Quit. What are you thinking about? Here's what he says. Because you are sons. Watch this now. God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, cried Abba, Father. Notice that's Abba. Exclamation. Right? Does your Bible show it as an exclamation? Come on now. Does, he, does it show us that exclamation? It should. And the, the, word, the word Abba and the word Father is an explanation. You understand it? He is your Abba. He, that means daddy. He is your daddy, father, God. God is your daddy, father. Now watch this. Here's what you miss because you don't listen. Listen, you read the Bible and don't listen to the Spirit teach it. You've got to quit doing that. You read the Bible, pause, Make sure you're filled with the Spirit and let the Spirit speak to your heart. For example, who's crying? In this script, who's crying? Now, I don't want a verbal answer. I want an inner dialogue answer. I want you to look at that. Who's crying? Does it say crying in your Bible? Does this, this Galatians 4, 6 use the word crying in the English? Right? 
then who, who's crying? Somebody's crying in your heart. Is somebody crying in your heart in that text? Yes. Holy catfish, people. Is the word crying there? Somebody's crying in your heart. Would you agree with that? Somebody's crying in your heart. Who is it? The Holy Spirit of God. At what point does the Holy Spirit cry into your heart at the point of salvation? The Holy Spirit cries out inside your heart that you're what? That God is what to you? That God is what to you? He is your Abba Father. You've got to start, you've got to start reading the Bible in the Holy Spirit and not in the flesh. You're missing, you're missing so much of the Bible by not reading the Bible filled with the Holy Spirit of God. John, the second chapter, 20 and 27 says, you have the anointing of the Spirit to teach you the things of God. You're not going to learn them in the flesh. You're going to miss enormous, wonderful things in the Scripture like that. You do understand that, don't you? You're missing so much of the greatness of the Bible that the Spirit of God inside you wants to teach it to you. You're missing little key things. Somebody's crying in your heart. Abba, Father, who was it? The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God who took up residence inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And he cries within your heart. You talking about celebration, joy? John 16, John 16, 7 through 11, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God brings you to a place of understanding of revelation that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and the moment you believe it, the Spirit takes up residence and begins to weep inside your heart, saying, Abba, Father, we're home, we're here, Abba, Father, we're here, we're at home. Do you not understand that, people? It's not you weeping. It's him weeping. We're home. We're home. We're home and earth. Because another one has come into the kingdom, Father, the kingdom has come in them. And he weeps. He cries. While there's a celebration in heaven, Luke 15, 7 and 10, while there's a celebration in heaven because another, another person got saved by the gospel of Christ on earth, the Holy Spirit takes up residence and celebrates and weeps over the fact that he has taken up residence. He's gone beyond conviction. He's now in the dwelling presence on earth. Oh, people, good grief. That's only one verse you ought to read. You ought to read verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. <laughs> and he says the same things to the Romans. He says the same thing to the Romans in the 8th chapter, 15 through 17. Do you know how many people in the church of Jesus Christ this morning will never hear a sermon like this? We'll never hear a sermon like that. We'll never hear a sermon like this. And you wonder why we want more people to hear this? You wonder why we want more people to hear this? Because you are sons. You ought to circle three S's in that passage. You ought to circle the word son, sent, and spirit. 
You had to circle that. Because you're a son, God sent his spirit, and the spirit takes up residence and cries within the heart of that person, I'm home. God is your daddy, father. We live as believers like we don't even know the Father, let alone that he lives in us. We live such carnal lives. We live such carnal lives. But we go to church. Yeah, but we go to church. How exciting is it to know that the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence and he wept within your heart as he revealed God is your daddy and your father forever. Not just for today, but forever. What a marvelous thing. A doctrinal point. Under point one, a doctrinal principle, at the point of grace salvation, God is revealed as your personal Abba Father by the Holy Spirit. You know where your assurance of that comes from? The Word of God. Galatians, the fourth chapter, four through seven, says it. Romans, the eighth chapter, 15 through 17, says it. It's up to you to believe it. There's where your assurance is, is God really my heavenly father? No, he's your earthly father. <laughs> oh, geez. I don't mind working for my lunch. Everybody thinks, oh, one day, God, I'll be with God in heaven. Listen, you're with God on earth. Where, where is the Holy Spirit crying where is he crying at? Where is he crying? In your heart that God is your father, your daddy father. Talking about your heavenly father, how about your earthly father? The one, the one in your heart. You walk around and doubt him. You start believing in him. You need to start believing that God is your daddy. You need to read Matthew, the sixth chapter, where he says, listen, I feed the birds. Sing a song to me. They sing to me every morning. I feed them. You do know that, don't you? You've read Matthew, the sixth chapter. Make sure you read that next time you down down, look to your father to get you up. Listen, he's over all, he's through all, and he's in all. Where? In. You know what I tell people when they come to counsel with me? I said, have you talked to the father a great deal before you came to me? Have you talked to the Father before you come to talk to me? You know, that if they're truthful, you know what they tell me? No. I say, well, I'm going to put a Band-Aid on you today. You know, I'm going to give you a couple pills, call me in the morning. You go home and talk to the Father. You go home and spend some time in prayer with God the Father, and then you come back and see me. We can really get some things done. We can get something done if you go home and talk to the Father. You haven't talked to the man that's over you. I'm not over you. I'm not your Abba Father. I'm not your Abba Father. I'm not your daddy. I'm sure you're glad about that. I know I am. Point number two, in eternity past. Well, watch this now. Better grab a hold of your seat somewhere because you don't need this one. In eternity past, 
the Son of God, the Son of God was chosen to be the centerpiece of the plan of God in the angelic conflict. Oh, you need to get that one. You can read about this in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, and Revelation 12. It's on your paper. Now, I ain't got time to read all that. If you go to this church, you'll finally learn all that. In eternity past. When I talk about eternity past, I'm talking about before the creation of the planet Earth. Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. And at, in that eternal life conference, your adoption, your election, and your predestination were all identified in Christ in eternity past. In salvation, they're all a done deal. It was before the creation of planet Earth at the eternal life conference that this whole plan of God of salvation and everything was laid out from time to eternity. Eternity, time, eternity. You know that's the way it works, don't you? Eternity past, time, eternity future. That's the way we think. That's not the way he thinks. He just thinks eternity. Lucifer, the, the angelic name of Satan, led an unsuccessful angelic revolt against the plan of God, as I just described. And when he did it, unsuccessfully, when he did it, he became known by title as the God, little g, of the world. Other names associated with his fall are Satan, the devil, and the evil one. We have studied all this. I'll do it again with you. It's coming down the pike. All of these doctrines that I'm laying out, boop, 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 you can find on our internet. Go to doctrinalstudies.com. You can study till your little heart's content. They're all there. 1 John 5, 19 is the God of this world. John 12, 31, 14, 30, and 16, 11, he's identified by Jesus Christ as the God of this world. Satan, as a result of his fall, he became the God of this world. Now, what he would like to tell you is nobody, nobody gets to the Father except through him. <laughs> That's what he would like to tell you. Nobody, as the God of this world, he would like to tell you that nobody gets to God except through him. And boy, has he deceived a lot of people with religion. Can you imagine deceiving the Israelites who have a half a Bible because they didn't stay faithful? They only have a half a Bible. That breaks my heart. Lucifer. Listen to this about him as the God of this world. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Circle, circle that, perishing. You know who are perishing? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. That's one of 13 charges of Adamic sin. That, that every, every believe, that's, imputed to every, that's imputed to every unbeliever at the point of physical birth. Perishing. You're in a state of perishing until you get saved. Now, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believed in him would not perish, but, point of contrast, have everlasting life, eternal life. What takes the place of perishing? Eternal life. Something can never perish. So here's what he says. If our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. And he tells you why. Watch for the why. In whose case the God of this world, 
That's, that's Satan. The God of this world has blinded the minds of who? These only people he can blind the minds. Who, 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 who's he blind minds of? The ones who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ones who are unbelieving. Oh, you need to see the work of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 7 through 11. Of sin, why? Of sin, why? Ah, see? Uh-huh. See that? Yeah, I know. If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of, the, of those who are negative to the gospel hearing, unbelieving, they're unbelieving, they're unbelieving, not unbelievers, they're unbelieving, so that, why? So that they may not see, understand, enlightenment, revelation, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's his strategy. Who's Who's blind in the minds? Satan. He can't do it without your permission of negative volition to the gospel hearing. And when you go negative to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's your fair game in the angelic conflict. And he blinds your minds so that you might not see the inner light of your soul that you might not see that Jesus Christ is the glory of God because he's the image of God. Whoa. You getting all that? We love to quote John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Listen. He wants that light to shine in you and out of you. He wants that light, the light of Jesus Christ, to shine in you and out of you so that you become the light of Christ to the world. And believe you, there are a lot of people in your six feet of this world that need to hear that. Would you agree with that? And we need to be faithful to carry that. Let me get to three. I'll never get to four. Ever since the Garden of Eden, that is prior to the fall of Adam, ever since the Garden of Eden, the human race, and the fall of Adam, there has been a satanic war against the worship of one God and Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. You want to see how the war get started in the human race? You read the story in the, the chapters 2 and 3 of Genesis. This war is, is the war that's going on in your soul today is the war that's been going on to the, in the human race since the beginning. The satanic war against the worship of one God and Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what the devil says in Genesis 3 5. Listen to what he listen to how he lies. This is a guy who sells refrigerators to Eskimos. Listen to how he lies. Listen to what he says. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, from it, your eyes, the day you eat from it, the day you sin against God, God will open your eyes. What's Satan going to do when you go negative to, the, to God? What's he going to do? He's going to open your eyes or blind them. The truth is he blinds your eyes. He don't open your eyes. He blinds your eyes. Do you not see he's a liar? John 8, 44. Listen, you can always find him because his pants on fire. You know, liar, liar. You can always identify him. 
He says, in the day you sin against God, your eyes will be open. Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, listen, 2 Corinthians, third chapter. He is, he is deceptive. He is a deceiver. John 8, 44, he's a liar. Why would you ever go to the world for information when you have direct access to God the Father through the Holy Spirit? Why are you looking to the world to bail you out of whatever you're in? You know, in the confrontation, you know what happened to Jesus after he had been baptized by John the Baptist and declared by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world? He went to the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil, right? God sent him to the wilderness, a little wilderness training. And at the end of that training, boot camp, ministry boot camp, ministry boot camp, everybody wants to go into ministry, nobody wants to go to boot camp. Let me tell you, you won't be worth a flip until you go to God's boot camp. He puts all of his people in boot camp before he puts them in ministry. You whine and cry, I don't want to be in boot camp. <laughs> Jesus had to go through boot camp. And what you had to pay attention to is how he fought and won. And you have to see Satan's strategy. Matthew 4, chapter, verse 9. Here's what he said. He said to Jesus, if you will fall down and worship me, I'll give you anything your heart desires. Listen, the only thing your heart should ever desire is worship of God. The only thing your heart should ever desire in this world is worship of God. He'll offer you everything in the world, and you will take it to not worship him. Give me this and give me that. Give me this and give me that. Give me this and give me that. You'll sell your soul for a piece of bread. When are you going to stop that foolishness? The greatest thing God has already given you is the ability to worship him in spirit and truth. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. You sell your soul every day for a bowl of soup. Then you get tired of soup and complain like manna. What do you expect from the world? Bondage and slavery. You know what Satan was attacking in the life of Eve? Listen to me, categorical Bible doctrine. You know what he attacks in your life every day? Categorical Bible doctrine that you have resonant and needs to function in your soul. And he tests you every day. He tests your attitude. He tests your spirit. He tests you every day. And that's a good thing. Maybe you ought to keep a score, see how you're doing for a week. See if that pitiful attitude you got about, oh, woe is me, would be put in a closet for a while. And how a wonderful God over your life, a wonderful God who's over your life and through your life and in your life. Journal your complaining for a week and see if you'd want to live with you. You complain way too much. You should, be, you should be worshiping, you should be praying, you should be singing, you should be full of it. Mm. How about this? I'm going to close with this. In the days of King Saul, watch, watch, watch the devil. In the days of King Saul, Satan set out his very best, a veteran called Goliath. He sent his very best. Satan sent his very best, a veteran called Goliath. Goliath went out and he defied and taunted the living God of Israel by the dead gods of the Philistines. God sent out a young teenager, a rookie called David called David. We know that story. 
We know how that story went. Goliath said, you set out a young, skinny nobody. How insulting you are to me. And then he told David what he's going to do with him. I'm going to knock you all over this field, and I'm going to feed you to the beast of the earth. When I get through with you, yeah, 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 yeah. We call that smack talk. But you better be up to your smack when you talk it. David said, well, I tell you, I come in the name of the almighty God. And I'll tell you something, since you requested it, when this battle's over, I'm going to feed you to the vultures. Don't you know they got happy? Don't you know the vultures began to do in line, do the chorus line? Don't you know they did that? Don't you know that was a happy day for them? They had already fed off from a lion and a bear. They followed David wherever he hunted. And don't you know, they got happy. Matthew, the sixth chapter, God feeds them. He's going to give them a banquet. Get this nine foot. They're going to feed so much off of him. Don't you know they got happy? They's probably doing all kinds of, they probably flew over, over Goliath. You know, the five, the five uh, airplanes, you know, they flew over and did all this stuff over him. Well, they did in my book. When the day is over, the vultures had the feast. You know why? Because of God Almighty. Because of God Almighty. Because God, your Father, is over all. He's over all. He's through all. And he's in all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all that your grace has provided us. What is wrong with us, Father? We've got so much to be happy about, and we say sad all the time. We've got so much to talk about, and we talk about just nebulous things that won't change our life, won't change our heart. What's wrong with us, Father? What's wrong with us? How much time do we spend with you talking about the things that are so vitally important? Father, today, as I close in prayer, I parade the woman with a blood disease. I parade her before you. Incurable blood disease just like cancer today. I, pray, I bring her out and I pray to her before you because of your marvelous grace, Heavenly Father. And the great physician, our Lord Jesus Christ put a healing upon her body that we still talk about today. I ask for that today. I ask for that for Steve Bryant and Steve Calvert and Steve uh, Chafin. I pray for that. There are others also, Father, but those two are on top of my heart. I parade her before your grace. In my heart, I pray for that healing. These are men who will boast of your grace. These are people who will boast. They need that. I'm not telling you how to run your business, Father. I'm just telling you where my heart is. I'm not telling you anything. I'm just telling you where my heart is. I'm just telling you where my heart is. Take this offering today, Father, and give it to every need to the gospel of Christ as far as we can stretch it and as far across the world we can give it. In Jesus' name, amen.